Hi, good morning. Thanks for coming. Some of you weren't early enough, and I've got a bunch of people standing at the back. I'm sorry. I hope that you can see the slides. If anyone would rather have the slides on their own device, either to add some notes or to make them easier to read, um, they're already online. I've just tweeted them from my Twitter account, and if you look at, I'm also Lorna Jane on Speaker Deck. So if you'd rather grab those slides, that's where they are. Please help yourselves. My name's Lorna. I'm a developer advocate with IBM. This statement usually leads people to ask me what developer advocate does. It's a job of two halves. So I spend some of my time doing this kind of thing, explaining technical or IBM-ish things to developers. And I spend the other half of my time trying to explain developer-ish things to IBM. So that's <laughs> anything that makes things better for developers using IBM Cloud. That's what I do. My specialist topics are mostly open source databases, open source scripting languages, and of course, our cloud. Today, I'm going to be speaking about webhooks. Um, and this might lead you to ask, what is a webhook? A webhook is an HTTP host request. And I'm totally not going to do this, but I would feel entirely justified if I ended my talk now. <laughs> like, I think the pub's probably open, if anyone. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you some more information, but hold on to this. If you know about host requests, then you're already qualified to work with webhooks. This is everything that you need to know. You've also already seen them out and about, even if you don't know this is what they're called, right? You have seen webhooks in the wild. They're what power your Slack integrations. If you have your GitHub or GitLab um, projects chatting into channel, um, do not let me give the chat ops talk now. We'll be here all day. Um, but the idea that we can integrate two systems. You do something in one place, you push to GitHub, and that event causes something to happen in the conversation. I love chat ops. I love having notifications in the channel in context with the conversation that the developers are having. Um, if you are looking to integrate a system that doesn't have a click here to add this integration on Slack, you just choose incoming webhook and you can accept any kind of notification into your Slack channel. On GitHub, we have it with the builds. Um, this is a Travis CI build. Um, somebody opened a pull request, and the build failed. We know not to merge it. But that build was run on Travis in response to new commits on GitHub. And that integration is also a webhook. Webhooks are all over the place. Um, I use them quite a lot with Zapier, which is an amazing platform. For, do not Google this now. Listen to my talk first, right? Because <laughs> it's too interesting. But if you haven't played with Zapier, have a look. It's a brilliant way of integrating lots of different events. Something happens on Dropbox, take a copy of it, upload it here. When you tweet this, do that. Add it to a Google Doc. Somebody mentions you, put it over here. So there's lots and lots of ways that we can use these webhooks to exchange data between systems, to allow systems to react to one another. Exchanging data between systems over HTTP, and you're thinking, I think she's trying to sell us APIs with a different name. Let's compare those two ideas, how APIs work. The client asks the server, please may I have some data, and the server says, Here's your data. Unless there isn't any, in which case it kind of says, nope, in a friendly way. Compare this with webhooks. The same conversation takes place, but the server starts the conversation. The server says, hey, client, I have some data for you. And the client says, thanks, smiley. In HTTP, we spell this like, 200 OK, um, but you can think of it as thanks, smiley. So that's a webhook. The server starts the conversation. The server has to know where the clients are that would want this data. 
So there's a little bit of preamble. We have to set this up in advance. Um, like many excellent technical concepts, these things seem pretty much equivalent until you think about how they're going to work in practice under load or over time. Um, so let's have a look at this. And for this, I've flipped the diagram round. Time is going left to right with the client at the top and the server at the bottom. So with an API model, we're going to be polling. The client asks the server for some data and may or may not get some. And you can see this quite chattery uh, set of traffic going on here. And only one piece of data getting delivered the second conversation along. Compare this with the web hooks. When there's some data, we send the data. We don't need to talk about it the rest of the time. Right? We're not doing an ongoing anything? No. Anything? No. Right? Web hooks are a bit more efficient. It isn't a coincidence that it's GitHub that I keep using as an example. Can you think about how many repositories you have on your GitHub account or maybe your organization's GitHub account? Now think about what the web traffic would look like if your CI servers were pinging every one of those repos every minute to look for changes. And you'd have to wait up to 60 seconds for the build to even get in the queue or the message to come in the channel. And to us, that's outrageous. Who wants to wait 60 seconds? What is this? An overnight batch CSV import, right? We're accustomed to this reactive programming that the on-demand webhooks give us. I wanted to touch a little bit on the data that we put into the webhook payloads. And I had this brilliant idea that I would show you a real example. <coughs> webhook payloads are quite verbose. There are 111 more lines not shown here. I experimented with a smaller font, but it was basically nonsense. So, <laughs> right, verbose is kind of where it's at with webhooks. And it's something that you need to take into consideration when you're designing payloads of your own. We often work with this kind of loose spec, JSON, nested data. Um, and we try and include the majority of things that a user is going to need. Um, here you can see that we've got the previous commit ref, the new commit ref, some information about what happened here, a link to comparison. And then inside the commits array, there'll be information with the commit ID, the committer ID, the timestamp, the email, the message for every commit. All the details of the repository, all the links to the contributors and branches and pull requests and everything of that repository. Um, and the same for the pusher and the sender, which are normally the same, but not always. So there's a lot of stuff in here. And I think it's a fairly typical uh, webhook payload idea. When you're designing webhook payloads, it's exactly, it feels very machine oriented, but we exactly need to begin from a user story. Why would a user subscribe to this webhook event? What is it they're going to do next? What, what reaction are they having? Because if you send just the commit references in an array, and there are, let's say you're the Linux kernel project, right? And there are tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people subscribe to that event. You send, you send out the webhook from your wonderfully scalable system, which I'm going to show you how to build. And then every single one of those consumers makes an API call for each commit reference to get the name of the committer and the commit message and the other information, right? Okay. And this is what I like to call a DIY thundering herd problem, right? You made this. <laughs> you sent out an incomplete event notification co and caused all of those incoming API requests. So be careful. Try to think about what people are likely to do next. Feel free to go minimal with your payload, but then look at which API calls get hit next and start adding data in. It's, you should be safe to add data into your payload. That shouldn't break other people's code. Um, we 
over years of working with APIs, I mean, I've been building APIs long enough that we considered not only the cost of the user's data package um, and the speed of the network, but also whether they would have a chip in their phone powerful enough to decode this format, right? A lot of them didn't have good string manipulation chips. I'm going back a while. And for APIs, for mobile-facing stuff, even for client web-facing stuff, we tend to try to keep things quite small. We're very conscious of packet size. Webhooks are, for the most part, server to server. They're two server-side applications communicating with each other, or, you know, 20,000, however many, all communicating with each other. You can assume that these are powerful machines on a decent network. So verbose is actually OK, depending on your use case. Um, keep the data format simple. I saw a project a while ago which had this absolute, I mean, it was, it was glorious. It was, it was beautiful, sort of validated schemas and whatever. No third party could integrate with it because it was just too complicated and it wasn't well supported enough across different programming languages. Seriously, JSON, BSON, some Apache Thrift, some sort of serialized format, just keep it super simple and very standard, and then everyone can integrate with you. Please don't forget that uh, we know how to secure HTTP traffic. We've been doing this web thing for a little while. <laughs> um, so don't forget how to do that, and don't invent anything new, right? We know how to secure this. Think about what your attack vectors are. I think this is a massive issue in our industry right now, particularly with the advent of the Internet of Things, um, where security seems to be completely optional um, <laughs> in many cases. So don't go there. Um, think, about, think about what can happen. If you are receiving webhooks, right, you've got an open endpoint. Anybody could, point, could post to that. What could that do if a lot of requests came in? If you're publishing webhooks, what if a lot of people subscribe to that? How much can your system scale? Or how much potentially wasted resource do you want on that? Do you need to register everybody? Think about what those things can do, because these are at, this is at scale. So it's not a person making a web request. It's a botnet taking all of your platforms out, or at least running up your hosting bills. Always use SSL. This is non-negotiable. If you are doing webhooks and you are not using HTTPS, you are doing it wrong. There are very few situations where I tell you you are doing it wrong. Not using SSL on production webhooks, you're doing it wrong. Um, if you register with a Git for a GitHub webhook, you'll notice that they offer the shared sec the secret option. If you set a secret, they use that to create a hash that you can then check on your side when the packet arrives. Everything you know about HTTP is good. Um, hopefully, I'm not teaching anyone anything new. OK, the bunnies are here <laughs> to remind me to slow down and just take a break between sections so I don't blow your minds completely. I mean, I'm not promising I won't, but. <sighs> right, <clears throat> going to show you how to publish webhooks from your own PHP application. Before we start, let's talk about why you might want to do that. Please just don't go and publish webhooks for no reason. Um, there are some very clear use cases. The first one has to be the GitHub continuous integration problem, right? Something pulls your API loads and mostly gets no data. Brilliant, move it to a webhook right now. Or at least offer it. Maybe not everyone knows how to handle those webhooks. Not all of your clients want that. But if, you're, if you have an API, you have a lot of polling, then yes, um, I would definitely recommend it. If it's common for another application to react to changes in your application. Now, I'm saying application like this is yours and this is going to be like some other third party somewhere else in the world. I am sure that a lot of you are moving to a more sort of modern microservices, componentized architecture. One application and another application could be components within the same organization. 
This is the most common use of webhooks I see, internal integration, sending notifications between parts of your own system. Those parts might be owned by other people. So the other team might own that component, you own this component, and you just agree on how you, how you integrate. Um, and I see both webhooks, but also uh, message queues in use here. Um, I also see webhooks a lot for notifications. So um, especially if you're using like an, ex an external or third party library for push notifications to devices, um, that kind of thing, then um, that's a really good use case as well for webhooks or even just moving your own notification stuff out into a separate component. Webhooks can really help with that as well. So with that in mind, I have built you an example application. Tried to keep it quite simple. Um, and it is a <laughs> retro guest book. So once upon a time, quite a long time ago, was probably if you were online before the year 2000, we all had websites. And these websites had guest books on them. I'm conscious not all of you were online before the year 2000. So I'm just going to explain this to you, and we'll skate over how old I am, OK? <clears throat> And the idea of the guest book is exactly like you see in a nice holiday cottage or a hotel where you write your name and where you're from and how much you liked the place, right? You always write something nice. That is exactly what the internet was like in 1999. Because we had these guest books on our website. It's like early dynamic web pages. And there's lots of people laughing at me in the audience. <laughs> and, you can, and without registering any users, without any moderation on the comment content at all, People could write their name and write what they liked about your website, and we displayed those things on our websites. That was a real thing. Lots of people just shaking their heads at me. I know, I know. But it was, it was genuinely, it was a real thing. Ask me about web rings in the bar. It'll blow your mind. OK, so this example application is a guest book. So it allows us to write our name and leave a comment. It allows us to see those comments that have already been stored. And because we're really cutting edge with our guest book, it also sends webhooks. You can register to get notifications of a new comment. If you just can't wait to check the database later, you can get a webhook notification of any new comment on your guest book. It looks like this. Uh, the reason it looks like a developer made it is because she did. Um, well, it's got CSS. What do you want from me? <laughs> I'm an API developer for a reason, OK? Um, and the process when you fill in the form looks something like this. First, we validate the data. Then we write the data to the database. Well, then we normally return a response to the user. But we're going to deal with webhooks. We're going to send the webhooks to the subscribers before we return the response to the user. There are a few ways we might do this. <clears throat> Some of them make more impact on how long the user has to wait than others. So option one for this turquoise circle is simply to look up the list of webhooks and send each webhook in turn. And if there's 10,000 people registered, the user's going to wait a really long time to see their page. OK, so we could probably improve on that. Um, let's use a queue. A queue is ideal for asynchronous processing. Don't let me give a whole rabbit MQ talk now. I'm determined to get you to the front of the lunch queue. OK, so <laughs> we have a queue. So what we do is we take the new comment that was made, we take that data, we look up a list of webhooks, and we just stick all that data in the queue, fire and forget, and we return the response to the user. Why am I looking up the webhooks from the web page? We could do that later. I like to look up the list of subscribers here because the website component already has access to the database. It's already reading and writing to the database. If every single part of your system writes to the database or reads from the database, um, you've just created some almighty, that's not microservices, that's some kind of almighty mess. I know a lot of organizations that have converted to microservices, and coincidentally, their DBA resigned. Yeah, right, this is what happens. So we need to be. <coughs> We need to be really careful about our um, data hygiene. So I am going to do all the database work up top. 
put it all on the queue. I don't need to look anything else up after this point. So this is all independent. And then, yeah, we'll write a worker that takes the message off the queue and sends those hooks in a loop. Awesome. Um, I just want to jump in with some PHP code. This is how you write to a queue. So here is the, this is all on GitHub. So you can see the full version where I just ripped out a load of, I think you all know how to write to databases. I took that bit out so it would fit on the slide. So first of all, we sanitize the incoming data from the form that you saw. We save the data to the database. We pick up a list of webhooks. We assemble the data, we connect to Rabbit, and then we just create a new message and publish it to the queue. So this is all the code you need to write to RabbitMQ. Feel confident you're all going to handle this. So if you're not already working with queues, go for it. It's really not that hard. Um, I'm using RabbitMQ here. We have it on IBM Cloud. That's not the only reason. <laughs> um, I actually love RabbitMQ. It's not really a hardship, but it's like, oh, I have to use Rabbit. How terrible. Um, but if you're using BeanstalkD, I have known and loved. I've used Gearman with PHP as well, a bit, bit further back. All of that stuff is good. Um, if you're stuck, Redis can do it. Like You probably have that in your stack already. So nothing really, I'm not hiding anything complicated from you here. So we could do this. Website puts messages on the queue, and the worker just loops and sends. This is kind of tedious. And if something goes wrong partway through, we don't really know where we got up to. So at the risk of delivering a RabbitMQ lecture, I think you're geeks, and you might be interested. Um, <clears throat> here's how I really do it. So I do exactly the same. I put the comment, comment data, list of webhooks onto a message. The first worker picks that up and puts one new message into a different queue for each webhook we need to send. So one endpoint and the message data into each one. Those jobs that go in the second queue are now independent. This is what distributed systems are made of. They do not have any external dependencies. They do not need to make any network calls. They do not need to look up anything about the database. We just have a worker that will, we can now scale this horizontally as much as we need to because every job is independent. And this is why I do it this way. Webhooks, because you're holding the connection open, can, can be a real difficult performance issue. But, and if you've worked with the Slack integrations, you don't respond within three seconds, they close the connection. And this is because otherwise they run out of web server, right? Holding connections open, waiting for you. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about receiving webhooks in a bit. But just this is why I do it this way, is to, 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 to keep each piece independent and to allow you to scale up. Obviously, I'm hoping all of you will write terribly successful applications, and therefore you'll have to scale up loads because you'll be really successful. So this is what we've got. The website puts things in the queue. The first worker puts more things, one per endpoint, into the notification queue. We have a bunch of workers actually sending those webhooks, which is sort of relate relatedly slower. I am going to attempt to demo that guestbook and show you around how those moving parts actually move and how you would do this as a developer. For my endpoints, I'm going to use a tool called Request Bin. This is um, a, f a free tool. It's hosted by RunScope. So if you find Request Bin doesn't do what you need, you'll find RunScope does do what you need. Um, but RunScope support Request Bin. It's also an open source project. So if you're sat close enough to one of the screens, you can see I'm actually running it on a VM. Um, it's just Python, and I think it has a Celery dependency. And I use this loads if I'm not sure if I'm sending the right web format or anything. Just put this in as your endpoint, and then inspect it. You'll see an example. So let's see if I can run a video and talk at the same time. This will be a challenge. All right. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to the RabbitMQ management console. This is just a plugin for Rabbit. It gives you a web interface. At the top, you'll see how many messages are in the queue, all the queues. And down here, you'll see things being um, published to the queue, um, delivered, acknowledged. We'll see those graphs changing as we go through. So 
here we are with RabbitMQ. And the first thing we need to do is set up these endpoints with request bin. So this is what request bin looks like. Click the big green, I'd like a new request bin button, and copy the URL. Here's the guest book. So we will register our webhook endpoint with the guest book so that new comments will be send notifications to that endpoint. So here's an endpoint. This isn't all that interesting unless you have more than one endpoint, so I'm just going to do that again with request bin and register a second URL um, with the guest book so that we, you'll see that we go from one message to two messages. All the workers on this system are currently stopped. If they weren't, you wouldn't see anything on the RabbitMQ admin console because we're like sending a web request. It's quite quick. Um, I've definitely had this problem before when developing with any kind of queues and workers set up, you, I would very strongly recommend that you regularly stop all your workers while you're developing and testing the system because that shows you what happens when the queues are building up or the workers are stalled for any reason. So you should see what happens if just the queues are quite long and it's slow because on dev you never see that. You don't see it until load testing, but you can kind of preempt it. Um, I had one where I could reliably do the image processing on a new registration before we loaded the welcome page, except one day I broke my workers and I realized that if it wasn't there, <laughs> it was the ugliest error ever. And we put in a placeholder image, which we never saw, forgot about it. Um, we were soft live and then a famous footballer tweeted a link to it. Lots of people registered, strangely enough. Um, and the, the image processing queue fell over quite quickly. But it all just kept on working. Users had an experience that showed them some sort of placeholder image, and our workers eventually caught up overnight. And we ran out of inodes. It was like, anyway, wow, that was a tangent. Right, let's add a comment. <laughs> so <laughs> remember, this is a guest book, so we're going to write something nice, a bit like you're going to do in your joined in feedback later. Um, <laughs> so we save a comment, and we check out the RabbitMQ admin console. Oh, yeah, look. A single message has arrived. We've added one comment. We're in the first queue. Now I'll start the workers. So this is just the first worker. And if you have a look at what happens here, in the bottom graph, I've had one message acknowledged and two messages published because we took the list of webhooks, list, there's two of them, and our comment data and turned it into two messages. These are independent. If I now start the other worker to process the second queue, which is why I've got them running under different system D jobs, here it is. Let's start that service and check back with RabbitMQ. Yep, I've got two messages acknowledged and nothing in the queue. We can also go and check out request bin because they'll have re request bin is where we'll have received our webhooks. It doesn't scale up all that well, so I'm not sure if you can read this, but it shows an incoming post request, all the headers that were sent. This can be really useful for diagno diagnostics if you need to. You can see everything that came in, the content type, and here's the actual content, which is the comment of my session coming in there. And the same if I, requ if, if I refresh the other request bin as well. Another bunny? Yeah, okay, good. I'm really glad I put these bunnies in. Also, kittens are overrated. <coughs> <laughs> My team saw this talk rehearsal, and they said, no, no, it needs, it needs more cats. It needs, <laughs> needs more cats. And I was a bit like, <sighs> it's all about the function you need the thing to perform rather than what they look like. So thanks, bunnies. You're, uh, you're helping me here. So what you've seen there is how in a PHP application, we would add messages to a queue and then process those messages. You've seen kind of, there's a lot of moving parts there. If you're accustomed to just web server sends, web browser sends request, web server sends response, there's a lot moving here, but I'm hoping that I'm showing you around. All right. Let's look at the other side of this. Now, I think this part is the most important part 
of this talk. I'm not sure that every application has a use case for publishing webhooks. Just depending on what you're doing, it may not lend itself really well. But I think receiving webhooks, integrating with other people's applications, whether it's in your actual application or in your bot or uh, other internal <coughs> tools, I think as developers, this is something we can all work with. Um, so if I lost you already, then please tune back in. I promise to be less scary. Okay. Just remember, it's just a post request. It's a weird setup because it's kind of like a backwards API. If you're building an API, then you, know, you are the server and people ask you for things and the post request comes this way. Whereas often when you're receiving webhooks, you're kind of the client, but the HTTP traffic comes in the same way. PHP is designed to solve the web problem. It is ideal, perfect for these kinds of applications. Some things I'd really like to just kind of flag or recommend to you is to think hard about what needs to be done immediately when the webhook arrives and what can be done asynchronously. A lot of the time this doesn't, well, it's a webhook, so it's not really real time anyway. A lot of the time it doesn't need to be instant. And if you are doing processing in, as the webhook arrives, then you're holding your um, web connection open. And this way lies madness. Holding open web connection, incoming connections, is where the hockey stick graph curve comes from. Because then everything's waiting, and everything's waiting, and everything gets slower, and then we all goes wrong. So if you can, and this depends on your application, just accept the data. Make sure, store it, make sure you've got it, and then send back the acknowledgment. I already remember 200, OK, smiley, yeah? Um, I already mentioned that Slack have rules about how quickly you need to respond when you do this. Right, so you need to, there isn't time for you to bootstrap, a, bootstrap an enormous full stack PHP framework and check that all the incoming data is valid and the accounts are active and then re, re I used to work on an, a smart energy system and it recalculated the monthly running totals every time a, a reading came in. Well, the readings came in every five minutes but we had a 48 hour lag on processing them because we were constantly reformat, recalculating the running totals, right? So really think about what you're doing here. If you can, just store it and process it later. You've all worked with systems that do this. Um, if you've integrated with PayPal, um, then you get that, um, note, that callback later so that the, you, f you forward your user to PayPal, they get forwarded back to you, and then you get the notification to say, yes, the payment went through. Right, so that's an out-of-band notification coming back to you. You can do that with webhooks. Try not to validate data, try not to hang around, try to just accept it and log the incoming um, body of the data in full. Always just log the whole thing. I have been increasingly moving this kind of functionality to a serverless endpoint. Um, one of the reasons that I like to store immediately is just to try to protect myself against the very bursty nature of internet traffic in general. Webhooks in particular, it tends to be the stuff happening and there are hooks everywhere, or it's quite quiet. Um, with that smart energy project, they used to instrument a whole block of lats and then like turn it on all at once. Every device in the building would phone home, the server would fall over. I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> so look out for that. Look out for being able to accept all of that data and process it, even if it lags by a few seconds, right? That's most applications, it's fine. Let's talk about serverless. I'll try not to talk too much about serverless. The serverless technology, and I'm just gonna try and introduce it. I know some of you haven't used it. Um, the idea behind serverless, I mean, I love the name, serverless. This is nonsense, right? It's right up there with no ops. Right? No ops, okay. I might not need to do any ops. I'm a developer. It is best if I do not do ops, right? But somebody did the best ops you've ever seen. And calling it no ops seems a bit rubbish, really. Serverless is the same. They're really awesome, excellent servers. And what happens is you write just a function, 
and I'm about to show you an example. And <clears throat> you don't worry about the operating system, the framework. You need to worry about your language dependencies, but essentially you just write a function and you deploy just the function. It gets containerized for you. And you just say, when this happens, run my function. You can run a command line, make it run. It's very common, and we'll, this is what we'll see in this example, to hook it up with um, like an incoming HTTP request. When this request, when a request comes to this endpoint, run my function. Um, it might be when there's a change on that database, run my function. Um, every five minutes, run my function. When this value of, of this feed crosses this particular boundary, run my function. Right? You just set up the function. You, and what's beautiful about this is it's incredibly simple. It's much easier than any like actual whole framework PHP. Right? Is it so small? It's like writing really small um, command line apps, but you just run them in the cloud. It's pay as you go. If you deploy this and nobody uses it, it doesn't cost you anything. There's no capacity planning. There's no, please sir, may I have another, ser may I have another server? It just runs when it runs and you can keep an eye on it. All of the platforms have free tiers. So for prototyping or low traffic sites, you're never gonna pay for it anyway. If the opposite is true, <laughs> and you're, you get a lot of triggers uh, causing your function to run, then it just scales up horizontally. When you turn on the building of sensors and all those uh, devices phone home at once, we'll just run some more of those function and handle that load. So again, you need to think about horizontally scalable systems and how you can keep each of those pieces of work as independent as possible. Um, you've probably heard of Amazon Lambda. I w obviously, I, this is, here comes the IBM Cloud story. But they pay me and my hosting bills. There's nothing to not like about this. Um, IBM Cloud has IBM Cloud functions. It's actually a hosted version of an open source project called Apache OpenWhisk. So you can develop with that locally or run OpenWhisk on your own hosting anyway, or we have a hosted version that I use um, and like. Apache OpenWhisk, and I think some of the other serverless providers, but I'm not sure, supports PHP out the box. So you don't need to Dockerize it or whatever you, to work around it. Supports PHP out the box. Um, that implementation was done by Rob Allen, who I can't embarrass because he's on the stage upstairs, so he's not here for me to point at. Um, so we have PHP running on our platform. So serverless PHP, yeah, that's a thing. And it lends itself to serverless really well because PHP is pretty simple, it reads from top to bottom, it's great, works well with incoming web requests, it's a web, it's a web language. Um, if you want to use another platform, I'm not sure, but I suspect in a room full of PHP developers that maybe some of you know some JavaScript, maybe? <laughs> uh, and Node.js is supported on all of the platforms, and typically you'll find yourself reading the Node.js documentation on all the platforms, regardless of which language you're using. So that's, that's serverless. You write a function, you deploy the function, you say when it should run. So here's my function. It's written in PHP. A Little bit of white space crime to fit it on the slide, not too much. Sorry about the closing bracket, really couldn't fit it on. So you write a function and it should be called main. And that function accepts one parameter. Everyone's still with me. Okay. <laughs> that function accepts one parameter and it's called params, it could be called whatever you like. And here is all the incoming data. So if you've set variables when you deployed your function, like environment variable style, then you'll find those here. Um, if there are variables that you set when you called the function, um, then you'll find those here. Um, if you are, you can optionally set it up to pass incoming post variables or pass your JSON body and stuff and extract those variables as well. I've not done that because it makes me a bit register globals frightened, itchy. <laughs> On line two, I'm accessing that parameters variable to pull out the Cloudant URL. You'll see that being set in a demo in a minute. And then I'm manually decoding the body. So to get the body just as it was, it comes in base64 encoded, so you can just decode it and then 
minus JSON, you've just seen my webhook. This code is going to receive the webhook that you just saw me publish. Um, so I'm just JSON decoding it. And notice that this is a very optimistic version. Everything's fine. We successfully decode everything. There's no problems with the base64 encoding. There's no, the, it's valid JSON every time. There are no error conditions. This is like totally optimistic. Developer advocate doesn't run on production code. So then we store it and, and we send the response. So here I'm writing to CouchDB. Um, I've recently published a new PHP CouchDB library. So if you're working with PHP and CouchDB, please try it and then tell me what you'd like done differently because it's new. Um, but it make, turned my 10 lines of code into three. So I, went, I am using it because I like it. That's why I made it. And what we do here is um, we connect to CouchDB. We say which database we'd like to use. It's called incoming. It's where I store my incoming webhook data. We set up some metadata to just to record when we received it and set the status to be new. If you are just going to come back and loop through the data that's come in and look at which hasn't been processed yet, then the status field's quite useful. Um, I'm using CouchDB, so realistically, I would be watching the changes feed. But for an ordinary database, you probably would want to come back and look at it like that. Um, and then, yeah, just create the record on line 10 and return thanks with a smiley on line 11, because that's how we do that's how we do webhooks. We send back that 200 OK, uh, and I'm sending back the smiley. Right, so let me show you this as it happens, because I, I want to give you a better concept of, again, how the developer experience is for that. So that would be this one. Here it is. So in this directory, I have some files. None of this should look alarming. You all use Composer, yes. Um, we've got deploy.sh. That's my hacky script to I just edited my PHP file. Here is what I'm going to run. I'm going to type those commands and walk through them with you here. Um, I've got a git ignore file because I've got a vendor file. Um, Hook.zip is what we're going to create. Index.php is where the code actually lives, where the function lives. And that will be our entry point. It needs to be at the root of the zip file that we're about to make. Uh, Logme.sh, don't think is under source control, but if you look on my <laughs> blog, it's um, to work with OpenWhisk, you can say, show me the last activations, the last functions that ran. And then you can do, give me the logs from this activation. So this is a script that like does one of those and greps it, cuts it, puts it through Xargs, and just shows me the most recent, always shows me the most recent log. Just a little hacky script. So here's my code. I'm going to zip it, and then I'm going to deploy it. And the reason that I'm zipping it is because I'm using that PHP CouchDB library. It's currently, I'm about to fix this, currently not available by default on OpenWhisk. But if you have any composer dependencies, um, Guzzle's there by default. That covers a lot of use cases. If you have any dependencies, then you can just use composer and then uh, zip it like this. So I'm using zip with dash r because I'm going to recurse down into the vendor directory. You probably want to use dash q here to avoid the insane output that you're about to see. Um, <clears throat> and into hook.zip, I'm putting index.php. That's where my function is. And I'm putting the vendor folder because I need those dependencies as well. And I'm including the autoload. So there's the zip file created. Next, we'll deploy this function. So. Here's a bunch of gobbledygook. Let's work through it. So BX, the IBM Cloud used to be called Bluemix. So its command is still called Bluemix, or BX for short. Then I'm working with OpenWhisk. So it's Bluemix, OpenWhisk, Whisk. And I'm going to create an action. I know that word doesn't say create. <laughs> but OpenWhisk, if, it's not, if it doesn't exist and you try to update it, I'll assume you mean create. So you can write update in all your scripts, and it'll always work. I love this. Just seems super friendly. So we're going to update an action. This is the name of the action, guestbook comment. right? When there's a guestbook comment, it's going to hit this endpoint. I've called it guestbook comment. It is a PHP action. I need to specify the kind when I upload a zip file. If you upload index.php without zipping it, without dependencies, it knows what to do. If you upload in, uh, index.js, yeah, it knows what to do. Um, but because I'm zipping it, it can't tell. So we'll say, please run it with PHP. 
I would like dash dash web raw, meaning please don't try and pass my incoming variables. I would rather do that myself and know where my data came from. Maybe I'm being old fashioned about that. Maybe not. Um, and finally, I need to specify where the code is. So that's the zip file that we just created. So cool, we updated the action. In fact, we've created it, but we, it says we've updated it. Now I've made it, I need to set those parameters. Remember, I need to connect to the database. So I'm going to update the action, give the name of the action, and specify some parameters. You just do that on the command line here. Um, and what I usually do is this step goes in the continuous integration server. So I just push to master, and Travis says, oh yeah, OK, here's the script that I run. Here are the environment variables that are already set up. I'll deploy these parameters with these actions. Um, or on OpenWhisk, there are also packages. Um, so I'm setting a URL there. This isn't the real URL, so then there's like a little pause while I set it correctly in the other window. So it's set to my real credentials, and the whole thing works. Brilliant. <laughs> now I'm going to get the URL of this action. So I just say to the action, what URL are you on? And it says, this mess. All of the serverless platforms offer API gateways where you can set up nicer routes and, all, and some authentication there. You can also set it up so that there's like a, a disconnect between the URL and you can change which action it points to. So that's really good for blue-green deployment. Trying to keep it really simple today. So I'm just copying and pasting the raw web URL. I often use webhooks just like this. I'm not sure if I should say that. I just grab the URL and work with it usually for the like, Slack bot notification type stuff. I tend to just use this. Anyway, so yay, let's add a new comment. First of all, I'm going to put that URL that I just copied in so that we register it as a webhook. And then when I add a new comment, the, the webhook will webhook. Here it is. Yay, more positive comments. There it is. It's quite hard to show an, an incoming webhook, but we did write to the database in our action that we created. We wrote to Cloudon. So we can go and have a look at Cloudon and see our data there. So there's our incoming data. This is the in incoming database holding incoming data. I'm not confused at all. Um, and there's the data. We can see it in detail here. I'm learning so much. Oh, lovely HTML, HTML escaping. Um, learning so much, and the metadata that we added as well with that new status. So our action received the incoming webhook from the guestbook and wrote it to the database and sent back the success response. Kind of give you an idea of how this would, how this would work. Do often also write to queues here at this stage. Um, so to put the, the incoming webhook data into a queue and then sort of deal with it later. That, that also works. Um, and you may want to store um, I'm using CouchDB. This is Cloud, and it's the product name for Couch, Apache CouchDB. It's an open source document database. If you've used MongoDB, CouchDB is in the same sort of umbrella area. They're both document databases, so you can store this nested JSON in your database. So you can add, the field, if the fields are slightly different, that's fine. You can store nested JSON. You can search on nested JSON. If you're not using a document database, then you might want to extract some of the fields that you're going to want to search on. Um, but if you're using Postgres, it has brilliant JSON support, and the newer MySQLs have probably all the, J all the JSON support that you need for this kind of thing. Awesome. One more thing I want to mention. I have a slide on it, so let's find the slide. Is it this? No, it's this. Yes. One more thing I want to mention is um, ngrok. In this example, I was pushing my receiving code to, um, to the cloud, making a serverless endpoint. A lot of the time, the development work that we do is on our local machines or on virtual machines. Um, and that's annoying for testing webhooks because you need a public URL to register so that the incoming webhook, so the server can find your client, but your client's on a virtual machine on your laptop inside the corporate network. OK. so. The answer to that problem is called ngrok. It's a brilliant tool. Um, you run it from command line, saying which port you would like to tunnel from. And it tunnels out to ngrok servers, gives you a public URL. And that URL, if you use it, 
allows incoming web stuff to come into your dev server. This is brilliant for testing web hooks. It is brilliant for testing websites on phones or other devices or asking other people in other locations to look at what's on your dev machine. That's not the good part. Okay, the good part <laughs> is that Ngrok has a dashboard. It allows you to inspect in detail the headers and body and everything of request and response of all the traffic that's coming over here. I use it a lot just to diagnose what's gone wrong between HTTP between two things. That's also not the good part. <laughs> On that dashboard, when you inspect the request and response, there's a button. And the button says replay. So if your webhook is the webhook that GitHub sends when someone adds a comment to a closed pull request on a particular open source project, right? You create that event once, capture it in MGROC, and if your response wasn't quite perfect, change the code, press the replay button. Change the code, press the replay button. You don't need to do that. You know, it's when you're testing the webhook for when a new user has registered and it's convoluted. Right? It's really frustrating. So this is the good part. You can inspect everything, but you can replay it and keep changing what you're doing. So, so powerful for lots of aspects of web development, but especially these incoming webhooks. Key tool. I had this in my demo, and I took it out because I'm really using serverless now. I had to leave the slide in to give you this tip. OK. By now, perhaps you've realized that I am a huge fan of webhooks. They've made my... PHP applications dance and sing in a way that I'm not sure how I'd have implemented a lot of those features without this. And I think in an increasingly componentized and event-driven world, all those big kind of rhetoric, software, architecture talks, they tell you how that you should do things, keep things separate. They don't really tell you how. Webhooks are, are one way you can do that and you're web developers, and it's a post request. And suddenly, all this stuff is within your grasp. Using them at the right time, knowing when they're useful. They're useful when one system or component needs to notify when an event happens, another system, where polling is less useful. Right? So something happens, we're going to broadcast it. It's pub sub. It's, it's event-driven architectures. I've tried hard to include what you need as a PHP developer, and it's all vanilla PHP, but you can do it in all of your frameworks. Um, and if you need examples, come and see me. Um, of how that implements it. I know there were a lot of moving parts here, and I put in a queue as well. You're a pretty qualified technical audience. I think you can handle it. And this is how I really do it. I didn't want to bring you a dumbed-down version. Yes, there's a GitHub repo. Yes, it's a simple example but it's a pretty good shadow of how I would build a more complex system as an engineer. I'm a developer advocate today. That's not what I've always done. Crucially, webhooks, they're HTTP. They're just the web. You understand the web. Um, you already know how to do this. You already know how to make a post request from PHP. If you don't know how to make a post request from PHP, you need to see me after class, OK? <laughs> Seriously, sit, come and sit in the front row. We'll do it. Um, <laughs> You know how to work with post requests, and this will enable so many things in your applications. Um, and with that, I just have a few links to share, and then I'm going to get you to the front of the lunch queue. Right. So um, please leave feedback. The organization is using Joined In. It is a brilliant way to let speakers know what's working, uh, not working. Please tell me what's not working as well, because I do this all the time. So other audiences will have to sit through this terrible experience if you don't fix me. Um, if you want to try any of the stuff that I've mentioned, um, check out IBM Cloud. We have free tiers. Your PHP will run there on an ordinary hosting platform. You can try out the serverless stuff as well. We have MySQL on our platform. Um, let me know how that experience goes, because it's my job to improve things. And I would like to improve things for the PHP community specifically. Link to request bin, link to ngrok. Um, O'Reilly are not here this year, which I would guess means you didn't buy enough books last year. Um, <laughs> But I am the author of PHP Web Services, which has, has a chapter on webhooks. So you might find that useful as well. Here's the repo for the example app. Here is the PHP CouchDB library. And with that, I'll say thanks for your attention. <laughs>